Okay, I did it. I was going to say. Okay. <laughs> I guess we're all ready to uh, start, so let's do this. Why don't we, why don't we pray, and then we'll kind of do a little review since we haven't met and we haven't had a, a Bible study, and we'll kind of um, just uh, reorient ourselves into what we're studying, why we're studying it, because it's always important to, uh, not just on, not just to study, but to understand why we're studying something and what it's designed to accomplish. So let's pray, and then we'll do a little bit of a, a review, okay? Our God and Father, we thank you again <clears throat> for our opportunity to study your word today, to rejoice in all that you've given us in Christ. And we know that the reason we have forgiveness is, is that you have put us in Christ. The moment we trusted you, Lord Jesus, as our Savior, that you died for all our sins, the Spirit of God placed us into, uh, into yourself as members of your body, and that now, Father, you are free to give us all things in Christ because, Lord Jesus, you are the heir of all things and all things belong to you, the heavens, the earth. And any blessing there is, it's because of uh, our identity in you. So we just thank you again for the opportunity to study your word and to rejoice in this great hope you've given us, Father, in Christ. And pray that the things we talk about, the things we look at, will be edifying and comforting to our spirit and soul. Amen. Amen. Okay. We have been in our introduction of the book of Romans, which really is the first 17 verses. Susan, we're in the book of Romans. And we're going to do a little bit of review since we haven't met for a while. This kind of a review lesson. But it's important to review things. It's important to understand the book we're studying, what it's designed to accomplish. So before we really look at the first 17 verses of Romans, let's just go back a little bit to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and the book of Acts, because sometimes there's confusion as to what different books of the Bible are designed to accomplish. <clears throat> when we look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, a lot of times people think that that has an exalted position over other books of the Bible, because these are the words of Jesus. But when we, when we understand all the scripture is the word of God, that, then we understand that the books of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John do not have a superior position to the rest of the books of the Bible. Even though from an emotional or sentimental standpoint, they, they might think they do. Because, well, those are the words of Jesus. But Paul says what he is speaking are the words of Christ, because Christ communicated unto the Apostle Paul what to write down, and it was inspired by the Spirit of God. So it's important to understand the different books of the Bible, and we'll get to Romans in just a few minutes, but when we think about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, <clears throat> it was really prophesied that there would be four books as far as the Lord's earthly ministry. The book of Zechariah, the second to the last book of the Old Testament. As Israel is going through these judgments because they've turned away from the Lord, God, God sends to Zechariah this message that there's actually going to be four presentations of the Messiah. And let's just uh, tur turn back to the book of Zechariah just real briefly, and we'll see... <clears throat> We'll see these four presentations in the book of Zechariah. And that's why there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's four presentations of the Lord's earthly ministry. So the book of Zechariah is the second to the last book in the Old Testament. And we'll just read these four verses that indicate that there are going to be four presentations of the Lord's earthly ministry. <clears throat> the first one is... Zechariah chapter 3, verse 8. And Jack, do you have the book of Zechariah? Yeah. Do you want to read chapter 3, verse 8? If I can find 3. Okay. Do you have enough light over there? Huh? you have enough light? Yeah. 
If you don't have Here now, O Josiah. Joshua. Joshua. The high priest, you and your friends who sit before you, for they are men of good omen. Behold, I will bring my servant the branch. For behold, upon the stone which I have set before Joshua, upon a single stone with seven facets, I will engrave its inscription, says the Lord of the hosts, and I will remove the guilt of this land in a single day. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor under his vine and under his fig tree. Okay, thank you. Very significant. In verse 8, it says, For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. The book of Mark is really talking about the Lord being a servant. It's a real, it's a book of brevity. It's about the Lord does this and the Lord does this. He's a servant. The next one is in the same book, chapter 6, verse 12. Brianna, would you read that verse? Mm -hmm. Zechariah chapter 6, verse 12. And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Okay. So he's not only a servant. This verse says he's the man. And he's not just a man, he's the man. He's going to be the perfect man. The book of Luke expresses the Messiah as the perfect man. So we see these, as the book of Zechariah is progressing, we see this, this, this presentation of the Messiah. The next one, uh, Deborah, is chapter 9, verse 9 in Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just in having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Okay, the third presentation is he's going to be the king. And you know, each one of these presentations, it says, behold. Now, when the Lord says that, he's saying, don't miss this. Behold. The man, the servant, the king. Matthew presents Jesus as Israel's king, the Messiah. And this is this is how he comes into Jerusalem. He's coming into Jerusalem on a colt, the foal of an ass. He doesn't come in like conquerors did in many days when you come in on a horse leading an army. He's, he's coming into Jerusalem as their redeemer. And he's, he, the nation has rejected him, but he's still coming in as their king. But he's not being accepted as their king. He won't be accepted as Israel's king until he comes back in his second advent and he sits upon the throne of his glory over in Jerusalem in this, after his second coming. But this is the third presentation. The fourth presentation is a little bit different and Susan, I'm going to have you read this verse. It's Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7. Hmm. Awake, sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is close to me declares the Lord Almighty. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered and I will turn my hand against the little ones. Okay, this is, this is the Lord God saying, the man that is my fellow. Well, the man that is my fellow is the one that's equal to God. He's my fellow. Remember, the Lord Jesus Christ, it, he was in the bosom of the Father. He, he came forth, the, the Word became flesh, and 
and he he was manifested as as God. And that's the book of John. The book of John points out the Lord's deity. He's not only a servant. He's not only the perfect man. He's not only the king of Israel. He is the word of God made flesh. And he's the man that was my fellow. That's that's his deity. So as we look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we, we see there's this presentation of the Messiah to the nation of Israel. And there, you know what? If you were a Jew at that time, and <clears throat> there should have been no excuse for missing who Jesus is. No excuse. In fact, there were blind people who saw it. There's one account where there's two blind men, and they're saying, Son of David, Son of David, have mercy upon us. They knew the Messiah would be the Son of David. That's one of his titles as the Messiah, the Son of David. Blind men could see it. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. The blind could see that Jesus was the Son of David. So there should have been no excuse. They, there's this presentation. Only ones that were steeped in their own self-righteousness missed it. And that was the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They missed it because they were, and John chapter 10 says they were going about to establish their own righteousness. And they had, they have not submitted themselves under the righteousness of God. Romans so, 10. Romans chapter 10. I'm yeah. sorry. What did I say? John. John. I'm sorry. Romans chapter 10 says they have not <clears throat> submitted themselves under the righteousness of God. So we see Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. As our New Testament opens up, there's this presentation of the Lord Jesus as Israel's Messiah. But we know he is rejected. And, you know, when we get to the book of Acts, we have this renewed opportunity for the nation of Israel. They still had an opportunity, even though they rejected their Messiah. They crucified him. I well, we think, how in the world could the Lord forgive that kind of cr crime? They crucified the Messiah. Remember what the Lord prayed from the cross? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He, he provided forgiveness. What he really did was he lowered the charge from murder to manslaughter. He said they didn't know what they were doing. Isn't that interesting? And they had a renewed opportunity in the book of Acts. And, you know, as Acts is progressing, we're not going to take a, a lot of time right now to review the book of Acts because our purpose is the book of Romans and our orientation in the book of Romans. But as we progress through the book of Acts, we had this renewed opportunity for the nation of Israel. In fact, the writer of Acts calls it repentance to Israel. He uses that phrase. And I think it's Matthew, uh, Acts chapter 5 that this, this repentance to Israel. And we see Peter going out, he's actually preaching to the religious leaders. He's not condemning them. He's giving them an opportunity to repent. There's still opportunity. But you know, as we progress through the book of Acts, even though there's thousands that respond to the, the 12 apostles, and there's many being added to what we call the little flock of Israel in the early chapters of the book of Acts, the remnant of Israel. We know that the book of Acts really speaks about God putting Israel aside. And Romans talks about that, the fall and diminishing of Israel. So the book of Acts is really explaining Israel's fall and diminishing. And the reason, the reason, as we look back and we see these things, God had an eternal purpose. God had a hidden purpose that he hadn't made known to in, in the Old Testament. He didn't make known in his earthly ministry. He made known to the Apostle Paul. We call it the mystery, the dispensation of Gentile grace. And the reason we're looking at Romans is, and we're, we need to be established in Romans, is that's Paul's first epistle. And the Apostle Paul is going to explain about, to us, as the apostle of the Gentiles, God raised up a distinct apostle from the twelve and sent him out to the Gentiles. And the Apostle Paul is going to tell us how to be established as Gentile believers. 
And that's what the first part of Romans is going to explain to us. It's going to, it's our orientation of that God is for us, that he, he's provided everything we need today. <clears throat> so any questions on any, any, any of those things that we went over? I know that's a real kind of a jet tour, but I wanted to go over just a little bit of why we're going over the book of Romans. It's, it's, as we, as we think about Israel's, or the Lord's earthly ministry to Israel, as we think about Israel's fall and diminishing, and God setting Israel aside. Remember, they're, they're not setting us set aside permanently. Because in Romans 11, it says, the gifts and calling of God are re without repentance. God's not going to change his mind about all these promises he made to Israel. But he has a purpose today he's accomplishing. And when he accomplishes this purpose, he's going to resume his purpose for Israel. He's going to graft them back in to the olive tree. And the olive tree is really the tree of God's goodness, the tree of God's blessing. So we have this, we have this opportunity today as Gentile believers to be a part of the, what Paul calls the new creature. We're not Israel. We're not spiritual Israel. We're not the nation of Israel. We're members of the new creature, the body of Christ. And it's interesting that, <clears throat> excuse me, only the Apostle Paul uses that phrase, the church, the body of Christ. No one else uses it because <clears throat> that was part of his distinct revelation. It's very important to understand that. It's his, part of his distinct revelation. So let's go, let's go over to the book of Romans. We've spent the last several weeks talking about our orientation, the first 17 verses of Romans. And there's some very specific things in the first 17 verses of Romans that we're just going to review uh, briefly. We, we, have these, we have the lessons on uh, YouTube. So if, if you want to see some of these lessons, you can go over some of these lessons. But as the, as the book of Romans opens, the first verse, and I'll, I'll read this, Romans chapter 1, verse 1. <clears throat> Everybody have Romans chapter 1? Mm -hmm. Verse oh. 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the apostle of God. Separated unto the gospel of God. You know, as the book of Acts opens up, there are 12 apostles. Well, actually, there's 11 apostles. Ju Judas has killed himself in, I think, the, you know, the first chapter of Acts. And, you know, that was prophesied that he would do that, he, that he abandoned his bishopric. He abandoned that office. God had to assign a new apostle. And God told them who to choose. It was Matthias. Remember, they cast lots. And that was how they did things sometimes in the Old Testament. They cast lots. And Matthias' lot was chosen. And he was, he was ordained to be the 12th apostle. So it wasn't the apostle Paul. He, Paul was not the 12th apostle. Paul was a, a distinct apostle from the 12th. It's important to understand that. We need to understand that God didn't raise up the apostle Paul to continue Israel's program. God has a distinct purpose today. And it's... It has to do with God creating the new creature. And as we as we progress in Paul's epistles, we're going to see this new creature is something that God is going to place into the heavens. Isn't that amazing? You know, you know who's up in the heavenly places right now, today? Who do you think is up there? I think it's Satan and his angels. Satan and his angels. Another way to be said, that is true. It calls them angels. But Satan and his devils. They are possessing the heavenly places. They have usurped God's authority in the heavenly places. And there's going to be a come, come a time. And the prophetic scriptures talk about the time when he's going to be cast out of heaven. Now, he's not in the third heaven where God dwells. But there are heavenly places, positions of authority 
that Satan and his devils are in that have positions of authority that God created to reign and rule over the heavens. And that's why God created man to reign and rule over the works of God's hands. Isn't that amazing? That God is God, God's going to use us to reign with him. Now he's going to be it's going to be Israel on the earth over the nations and this new creature God's going to place in the heavens to reign with him, to reign with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's pretty amazing. It was not the angels. The angels were not created to reign over the works of God's hands. Man was. If you go back to Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, it talks about Adam. He was created to have dominion. To, to uh, what's the other word it uses? Dominion and I can't remember the other word. To uh, rule. To, to rule. rule. Yeah, to rule and have dominion. Now, God gave him some elementary things at first to do, to name the animals and to go out and to, to have dominion. But ultimately, God is creating man to, to have positions of authority, like kings and princes. And that's, that's why he created us. So when we get to the book of Romans, the first thing God is going to educate us in as we get to Paul's epistles, remember, we have Israel's prophetic program, Israel's fall, we, uh, Old Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, God is still dealing with Israel. And then the fall of Israel, which interrupts God's purpose with Israel and the nations. And Romans through Philemon is a interruption in that program that God is doing something different today. It's important to understand the timeline. And when, when this dispensation is over, God's going to resume his purpose and plan with Israel and Hebrews to Revelation talk about the resumption of Israel's program and how God is going to call out a remnant from the apostate nation of Israel. And he's going to, to, to form this righteous remnant that's going to receive the earthly kingdom. It's important to understand where we fit in. And this dispensation of Gentile grace could end tomorrow. You know, as we see this as the world waxing worse and worse, at some point in time it will end. And God's going to take us out of here. Some people call that the rapture. That's not a, that's not a scriptural word in, in our Bible, but it's a, it's a doctrine that we're going to be caught up together with the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And that has another name to it. It's called the blessed hope. That's something we're to be looking forward to, the blessed hope. Our hope is not to just keep living longer and longer. Our hope is we're going to be called up together with the Lord. And those that die, actually, it says the dead in Christ shall rise first. They don't miss out on anything if you die. They rise first. And those, those of our loved ones, we all have loved ones that have died. Parents, brothers, sisters, uncles, those that have died. You know what they're doing right now? First Thessalonians says, talks about them which sleep in Jesus. They are having bliss. They're having the, the, the best rest they've ever had in the Lord Jesus. Isn't that wonderful to know? Them that sleep in Jesus, will God bring with them? So when you think about the those that have died, if if they're saints, they're in Christ and they're sleeping in Jesus. That's the kind of rest and blissful experience that words cannot express. That the glory of that. But we're, we're digressing a little bit as we think about the the timeline of the Bible. But as we get back to Romans chapter one, the first thing God is going to orient us about is there's a new apostle that God is sending forth. This is different from Acts chapter one because Peter says, or the apostles say to the Lord, will thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Well, Romans one says, Paul, he wasn't one of the 12. 
See, God raised up a distinct apostle separate from the 12 and sent him out to the nations. This is part of God's hidden wisdom. God kept it secret, this purpose that he's doing today. So the first thing God is going to orient us in is, I've raised up a new apostle and I'm sending him forth. He's not a secondary apostle. He saw the Lord, didn't he? Now, he didn't see the Lord in his earthly ministry. Well, at least at least it, Paul doesn't record anything about him seeing the Lord in his earthly ministry. The things that Paul is going to communicate in his epistles is how the Lord communicated from heaven's glory to Paul. See, that's a different apostleship than what the twelve had in the Lord's earthly ministry. It's a it's a hep, these are heavenly visions. Okay? So God is going to orient us in that I'm sending forth this distinct apostle under the Gentiles. And you know what that tells us? God cares about the Gentiles. We're not secondary. We're not subservient to Israel. God accepteth no man's person. We're not, we're not secondary saints to Israel, the saints that were Israelites. We're not secondary. In fact, we're going to see that as we progress in chapter 1, that we're beloved of God. Isn't that amazing? Paul writes to the Romans and he says, beloved of God. He loves, he loves the Gentiles. So the first thing we're oriented in is Paul's distinct Gentile apostleship. The next thing God is going to orient us in is the Lord's, he, what, something he calls the gospel of God. The good news of God. God has always had some good news. And it has to do with, with the Lord's exaltation. The Old Testament talks about the Son of God. One of the great passages is Isaiah 9. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the Son of God. And, you know, the gospel of God is the son of God's exaltation. But you know what? His exaltation provides for our exaltation. It's the only way, the only way we can be exalted is we need a redeemer. We need a savior. And let's just, let's just uh, Jack, do you want to read a couple more verses? Uh, I'll beg off. Okay, that's fine. I can read uh, it. Brianna? No, uh, I have to head out in a couple minutes, but yeah, I'll read, the, I'll read this, yes. Let's see. Chapter 1, if you want to start from the word separated and then read down to... Um, oh, wait, what, what verse? Uh, chapter 1. Well, you can read verse 1. Read 1 through 7. Okay. <clears throat> Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the holy scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, for whom we have received grace and apostleship, for, for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to the be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, when the Apostle Paul talks about the separated, the, I'm sorry, being separated out of the gospel of God, he says, which he had promised afore by his prophets. This gospel of God, this good news of God. And then he begins to explain it. He says, concerning his son. See that? The gospel of God concerning mm -hmm. his son. And then it goes on to talk about um, made of the seed of David. The Apostle Paul, when he talks about Jesus Christ, we need to understand he's not talking about a different Savior or a different Redeemer than what Israel had. That's Israel's Redeemer. The seed of David. Seed of Abraham, seed of David. But then it goes on to say, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. That's the Lord's exaltation. And we should look at that. That's marvelous. How the Lord, the Lord had this lowly start. He came as a man. 
He humbled himself and came, became obedient uh, unto death, even the death of the cross. He was a servant. You know, there's this one passage where somebody came to him and said, Master, I will follow you whithersoever thou goest. And you know what the Lord said to him? The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Are you going to follow me? You ain't going to have a place to even sleep. And you know, there are many that, that did follow him, and it wasn't an issue that they didn't have a place to sleep. They knew who he was. This is the Messiah. This is the Son of God. <clears throat> and you know, he had he came as a servant, but he was exalted. He was really exalted after his death, his resurrection, and you know, being brought up into glory and sitting on the right hand of the Father. This is his exaltation. But you know, this exaltation of his provides for our exaltation. Verse 5 says, by whom we have received grace and apostleship. See that? We have received grace and apostleship. So everything that he is exalted in and his exaltation, it provides for our exaltation. Isn't that wonderful? Grace and apostleship for obedience unto the faith. That doesn't just have to do with our being righteous. That has to do with, with our being godly. That has to do with the doctrines working in us so that we can obey him by faith. See, what God wants for us is not just to keep us out of the lake of fire. He wants us to be righteous, but he also wants us to be holy. And ultimately, he wants us to be godly. And they're, they're, Each one is talking about something different. When we, when we say we're righteous, we have a righteous standing before God. We're able to come right into his presence. When we say we're holy, we're able to do things that he'll accept. But when we say God is God wants us to be godly, he wants us to be God-like. He wants us to be like himself. And as we progress through Paul's epistles, the doctrine for this present dispensation of Gentile grace, we're going to see God is going to teach us how to think like he does. He's going to teach us how to live godly. And he's going to teach us how to labor with him. That's the ultimate goal, how to labor with him. The things we're doing are what he would be doing if he was here. So the gospel of God, his exaltation provides for our exaltation. And you know, the, the, the real exaltation here um, is verse 7. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. God is for us. He has brought us into a position where, in fact, Romans 5 uses the phrase, the atonement. We're at one with God our Father. We're in Christ. The only way we can be at one with God is we're in Christ. So, this exalted office of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what he did is he poured out his grace toward the Gentiles. That's how we could be exalted. It's his grace. It's When it says grace and peace, it's because of his grace that we can have peace with God. But, you know, as we go on in the first chapter, and this is our orientation. This is all, that's all, that's all this is. It, it's motivating us to start our education. Our, our orientation. God is telling us, I am for you in every way. And when we understand that, you know what it's, it's supposed to do in our spirit and soul? It's supposed to motivate us. I want to know more. I want to know what he has for me. I want to know all that he wants to give me. I want to know this, this position that he's brought me into with him. So this is our orientation. It's kind of like a uh, if you're in a college class, you know, the first day or two, it's kind of an orientation, isn't it? Here's what we're going to do. Here's the, here's the syllabus. Well, that's what Romans, the first 17 verses is. It's kind of a syllabus. This is, this is all you're going to get as you been, begin to read and study and progress in your education. Okay. When we get to verse 8, 
the Apostle Paul is going to tell us that, you know what, you had, the Romans had a great start, but there's a need for them to grow. They need to be established. They need to be established. And there's some very specific things that are going to be of top priority. When the Apostle Paul says in verse 9, uh, Deborah, do you want to read verse 9? Sure. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Okay. Verse 8 talks about the great start the Romans had. Their faith was spoken of throughout the whole world. They came to faith in Christ. They trusted the cross of Christ. They trusted the resurrection. They understood what God is doing, something different today. His message is being sent out to the Gentiles. They had a great start. But Paul is saying, you know what? He's The Apostle Paul is explaining something to the Romans about godly love here. He's, he's an example of godly love. See what the Apostle Paul says? Without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers. That's an example of godly love. God is going to teach us how to love. Well, that's not the first thing he's going to teach. That, that's one of the goals of our edification, as the edification is the word of God being formed in us. And as, But before he's going to teach us that, it says in verse 11, For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end ye may be established. The purpose of the book of Romans, and this is explained in our orientation, is that God wants to establish us. He wants God wants us to understand about our justification, that we're just in God's sight, that we're sanctified, which means God has set us apart for himself. We'll go over these words. Justified, we're just in God's sight. Sanctified, we're set apart for God's purpose. We're acceptable in his sight. We're able to, to start living unto God. And the next thing the Apostle Paul is going to explain to us in our orientation is there's a policy of evil in the world today that we can't be ignorant of. We can't be ignorant of this policy of evil. And that is verse 13. Uh, Susan, you want to read verse 13? Yes. Um, I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual guilt a spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brother and sister, that I planned many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now in order that I might have a, I'm sorry, I have a hard time seeing it. It's okay. That I, that I may have a harvest among you just as I had amongst the other Gentiles. Okay, thank you, Susan. Uh, you know, the Apostle Paul, as he's writing to the Romans, he wants them to understand that there was something that was preventing him. There was a... Uh, there was a satanic policy of evil to stand against what he was teaching. And that's the word of God. The word of God that wouldn't, would not just produce eternal life when people believe it, but it would provide the word of God working in us so that we can actually live unto God. And, you know, Satan opposes that. Satan's not really that concerned if people come to faith in Christ and they put their Bible aside and they just go off into the world and live ungodly. But what Satan doesn't want, and he hinders this by the course of this world, he, the course of this world hinders saints from living godly and, and being ambassadors for Christ and teaching the Bible uh, the way God would want us to teach the Bible and to laboring with our Heavenly Father not just proclaiming the gospel of Christ, the preaching of the cross, but to edify the saints. Satan is hindering that. He's, prevent, he's trying to prevent it. But you know, the Apostle Paul, in his ministry, Satan did not prevent 
or hinder the Apostle Paul. You might think, well, he was put in prison. Didn't that hinder him? You know, when the Apostle Paul was in prison, he wrote many epistles that didn't hinder him. In fact, he gives a principle later on in his epistles. He says, though I suffer as an evildoer, the word of God is not bound. He understood, you know what? The course of this world can put me in prison, but I still got a mouth. I still got a, a hand to write letters. And I'm going to keep doing this until my, my time on earth is over. And he did. He understood that adversary had no ability to shut him down. He understood the only thing that could shut him down was himself. That's important to understand. Satan can't stop us from living godly and being who we are in Christ. Only we can prevent that and stop it. You know what we do? We take this book and we throw it aside and we just fill our minds with what everything the world teaches. That's us stopping ourselves. And if we want to do that, God says, you know what? You're still righteous in my sight. You can do that. You know, you'll suffer loss, but you can do that. You're free to do that. We're not, we're not robots. We have the opportunity to take in the word of God into our mind and have it worked out into our heart and have it formed into our soul so that we can live unto God. Whether we're in prison or whether we're being persecuted or whether anybody listens to us, that shouldn't hinder us. Because, you know, our Father has set before us something so glorious that we should say, I want to be a part of what he's doing. I want that. And I hope you I hope that's what you say, you know, in your, your mind and in your heart. Because God is offering us something glorious. In fact, when we get out there to glory, he's not going to just show it to us. He's going to take his glory and he's going to put it in us. Isn't that amazing? He's going to take his glory and he's going to put it in us. So the Apostle Paul, as he's orienting the Roman believers, he said, you know, he, th these, are, these are foundational truths that we need to understand for our orientation and that are going to motivate us to progress in our education. Now, there's a difference between education and edification. Education is just learning a lot of things. Edification is things being properly formed in us. Like, think about an edifice, a building. You wouldn't, you wouldn't put the roof on the bottom and the walls on top of the roof. It has to be properly formed. Everything is in its right place. That's edification. That's building an edifice. And that's what God is doing. That's what God wants to do in us. He wants to build an edifice of doctrine through which the Lord can live his life in us. He wants, God the Father wants the Lord Jesus Christ to be formed in us. And that's as, as we go, th and that's why the Paul's epistles are in a proper order. You ever think about why they're in the order they're in? Some people say, well, the, the early church did that. You know, they determined. No, the Spirit of God did that. Romans is the first epistle. First, second Corinthians, Galatians uh, relate to biblical Romans. And then you have the advanced epistles of Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians. And then you have the what some people call the pastoral epistles. These are the advanced epistles that... what. They're the more advanced of us. So they're in their proper order. And we'll go through in more detail, you know, what each of the books, the doctrinal design of each of the books. But Romans is the book that's going to establish us. And let's just go over the last uh, part of this orientation. It's verses 14 through 17. It has to do with the gospel of Christ is the power of God. That's important to understand. When we say the gospel of Christ, it's a message. Now, I was at the Home Depot this morning, 
and I didn't get a chance to talk to the gentleman, but he had a cross on. You know, it's with the social distancing, it's a challenge in this day and age to, to do things. But when we, when the Apostle Paul talks about the gospel of Christ, he isn't talking about somebody wearing a cross. He's talking about the message of the cross and what it will produce when we believe that the Lord Jesus Christ died as our Redeemer. That's the, that's the, the power of the gospel of Christ, the gospel of Christ being the power of God. It's the message and all that the Lord provided for us when he died as our Redeemer, was buried, and rose again. That's the preaching of the cross. That's the gospel of Christ being the power of God. And it does not just provide for our having eternal life. It provides for us being able to live unto God. It has to do with the word of God working in us so that we can live unto God our Father. And what we'll do what we do will be accepted in his sight. Let's just read a couple verses here and then we'll we'll close. We're not going to go more than about another 5 minutes. We spent a lot of time to review, but it's been so long since we met I thought it was important to do that. Uh, verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The Apostle Paul said he was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. What, what do you think he meant when he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ? What's, you have any ideas what he means? He was not afraid to preach what or teach what Jesus wanted him to. That's, yeah. And that's important. We used to, what Jesus wanted him to do. The, you know what? The exact words. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh. That's. He went to prison many times. Exactly. So he, he was not afraid. And he was willing to, to, to teach exactly what the risen Lord communicated unto him. Exactly. You know, a lot of times, you know, people just preach today. You know, you know, you can you can look at different and it's not my goal to criticize others. But a lot of times you you'll you'll read something like uh, by a pastor or something. And it's like there wasn't too much there. Mm -hmm. Wasn't too much there that was edifying as far as uh, what the Lord did for us or how we can, you know, what the Lord, how he wants us to live. But it, it has to do with, you're saying, he wasn't afraid, exactly what the Lord communicated unto him. He was willing to go to prison because you know what? He understood there's a reward. Our reward is not this life, is it? Uh, we, we may have some uh, reward of, as far as the word of God working in us, producing peace, and joy and hope, that is of great blessing, those, those virtues, those attitudes. But our reward is resurrection and glory and all that our Father will be free to give us in Christ for the ages upon the ages. You know, this life, when you compare it to the ages, you know what it's like? Bloop. It is so short that it is beyond understanding how short it is compared to eternity. Eternity. The ages upon the age. Not just one age. My thinking is there, there may be thousands of ages out there. And each one, and that's speculative, but, you know, I'm not, I don't get that from Scripture. But as we think about the ages to come, each one is going to be more glorious than the one before. That's what I think. And in the Ephesians says, and the it, in the ages to come, he will show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Everything we get because we're in Christ. The exceeding. Right now we have the riches of his grace. But in the ages to come, it's going to be the exceeding riches of his grace. It's more than we could comprehend that he desires to give us. The God of all creation, the God who has no limitations, everything he's done is for us. Think about all that, all that he could give us. 
at my, at, it says, and I think it's, I can't remember the exact Psalm. I think it's Psalm 15. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. You know who's at his right hand? Jesus. Exactly. All the treasure, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are in Christ. At his right hand, they're all in Christ. And we are in Christ. So I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God under salvation. God is manifesting his work, his power today through some doctrine, through some teaching, through the <laughs> scriptures. It's not out there. It's in here. It's to make us just. It's to make us holy. It's to make us godly. That's the power of God. You know, the angels, it says that... Um, in different places about the angels are seeing what we're doing. They've seen creation. That was glorious. They've seen Israel's miracles. That was glorious. But they're seeing something today that is truly manifesting the power of God, and that's the power of his grace to redeem us, <coughs> to make us holy, and to make us like God, our Father. That's, that's the power of God. And when the Apostle Paul says, in, um, it's to everyone. We may, um, verse 16, to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. When we think about, when we go out into the, into the world and we see people, sometimes we think, well, they don't really look like they'd respond or maybe, you know what, it's to everyone. No matter how, what kind of sorry rascal they are. The gospel of Christ is for everyone to believe. It's the only way to have life. It's the only way to have eternal life is to believe the gospel of Christ, the message of the cross. Now, when we say the gospel of Christ, we're talking about the preaching of the cross. In Israel's program, the issue was Jesus is Israel's Messiah because they were looking for their Messiah. <clears throat> But for us, it's not, well, we're looking for Israel's Messiah. or we're, No, he's already come and proved that he was, he was the, Israel's Messiah. He's already proved that he was the Son of God. It's whether you believe what he accomplished at the cross of Calvary. That's what will justify you, make you righteous in God's sight. That's the power of God, the message. And we see it's not just to have eternal life, but it's to be able to live godly. Verse 17 says, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. See, the gospel of Christ is the just shall live by faith. Not just to be righteous, but to be able to live godly, to be able to live by his faithfulness. When it says by faith, that's a very precise uh, wording that it's talking about the Lord's faith. His faithfulness. You know, we understand we're in Christ. But we also need to understand it's by his faithfulness. He accomplished everything that needed to be accomplished. For us to be just in his sight. To be righteous. To have eternal life. And to be able to live unto God our Father. The Lord provided everything. <clears throat> so as we get to verse 17... And we believe these doctrines in the first 17 verses, our orientation that God is for us. He's provided everything we need. We're ready to start our education. Verse 18. And we're not going to start that today because we're at the end of our time limit. So why don't we stop there? Uh, any questions on anything that we went over? Could lot. you explain edification again? Okay, that's a good question. Edification, it's, it's really taken from the word edifice. You know, you think about a building. Mm -hmm. God is, God is, you know, in the past, God was, you know, the temple was a building mm -hmm. that it was very important to God. But right today, what God is doing is he's trying to form an edifice of doctrine in our soul. A properly formed, and it's got to be properly formed. Or there'll be misplaced things, there'll be missing things, missing doctrines. So it's as we as we progress in Romans and then through the rest of Paul's epistles, it's doctrines that will be properly formed through which the Lord Himself is going to manifest His life. Let me just stop this and then we can continue that. <clears throat>